Good morning and welcome as we come together to worship today. We are glad that you have chosen to be with us and we encourage you to invite your friends and neighbors to view our service as well. So let us begin as we worship together. Welcome to worship this morning. <clears throat> Let us join together in our call to worship. In creation, God has lived generously towards us. What do you bring into worship? We bring awe for the wonder of creation and a creating God. In Christ Jesus, God has lived generously towards us. What do you bring into worship? We bring our lives in service to God in Christ. In discipleship, God has lived generously towards us. What do you bring into worship? We bring praise and thanksgiving for God's new creation in us. Come and worship, share God's love so that all are fed in body and mind and spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have been so generous to us this week, and we offer our words of thanks. Be with us in our time of worship as we hear your word, as we listen to the beauty of music, as we pray together. Bless our time this morning. Amen. <laughs> This morning, I want to share a story called The Dot by Peter Reynolds. It's one of my favorite stories. Art class was over, and Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Her teacher leaned over the blank paper and said, Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm. Very funny, she said. I just can't draw. Teacher smiled. Make a mark and see where it takes you. She grabbed her marker and made and the and gave the paper a great big strong jab and said there. Teacher picked up the paper and studied it very carefully and said hmm. Pushed it back towards Vasti and said now sign it. 
she thought for a moment, well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. So she signed her name and gave it back to the teacher. The next week, when Vasti walked into the art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot. She had drawn her dot, and the art teacher had framed it in this swirly gold frame. Hmm, she said, I can make better dots than that one. So she opened her never-before-used set of watercolors and set to work. She painted and painted a red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot. She mixed blue with yellow and discovered that she could make a green dot. She kept experimenting with lots of little dots in many, many colors. Well, if I can make little dots, then maybe I can make big dots. So she splashed the colors with bigger brushes and bigger paper and making big dots. She even made a dot by not painting a dot, by painting around the edges. The, art school, the school had an art show a few weeks later, and her dots made a big splash. She noticed a little boy gazing at her, and he said, you're a really good artist. I wish I could draw. She says, I bet you can. Me, no, not me. I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. Vasky smiled, handed the boy a blank sheet of paper, and said, show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. She stared at his little squiggle across the page, and then she said, sign it. What I love about this story is how each person helped someone else to do better. The teacher believed in her and gave her the opportunity to learn about what she could do, and then she passed that on to the others. It's a wonderful story about generosity and people sharing what they can do. The Dot by Peter, Peter Rentals.
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and all things and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as many that had need. And, the, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and jo- generous hearts. And from 2 Corinthians, these words you will find in the 8th chapter in verse 7. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in earnest, and in, the love, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. This is the word of God. Holy wisdom, holy word. Amen. This morning, I'm with my final sermon around our theme, The Generous Life. We have been looking at how generosity can be a life-changing power in our life. We believe that God has called us to be partners in the world and blessing the people around us in a variety of ways. If you've missed the first two weeks, um, we highlighted seven different ways that you can be generous. You can be generous with your thoughts with your words, with your influence, with your money, with your time, with your attention, and with your belongings. Generosity is about taking your entire life, everything that you have and you own, and asking God to bless it and then bless the people around you. In, our, in my first sermon I talked about, it starts with just having an awareness of what the needs are. And then last week, I moved from the desire to be generous to how do we live. We put it into action. Our challenge was to start small and let God multiply the faithful efforts. Today, we're going to talk about impact. What comes to mind when you think about the word impact? If you're a sports fan, and especially a football fan, the first thing that probably comes to mind is what happens when a wide receiver and a linebacker come together. There is quite a loud impact. The first thing that you might also come to mind is if you find yourself losing your footing and thinking you're going to trip, and the impact you're going to have when you hit the ground. Normally, we think of impact that way the action of one object coming forcefully in contact with another. But there is another way to think about impact. Impact can mean having a strong effect on someone or something. A great example is if you've ever gone to the ocean and you've watched waves crashing up against the shore. You are actually experiencing multitude of impacts, not just the waves. You see, those waves are formed by energy that passes through the water. The wind actually causes an impact on the water. And then the friction and the energy causes those waves to move that you're seeing constantly on the floor. There is impact in that that we cannot see. And that is creating the impact that we can see. Now hear that again. There is impact we cannot see. And that is creating impact that we do see. Impact doesn't exclusively exist in sports or bodies of water. Impact is something that happens on human beings. And we have the ability to create an impact on someone else. I'm talking about the kind of impact that happens when we live generous lives. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. She was a woman who... uh, 
went off and did some missionary work. She was an IT and website designer. And at one point, she and I were having coffee, and I was asking her about how she got involved in all the things that she did in her life and what was one of the most important things that she did. And she began to tell me that she volunteered all the time at Tacoma Community House, which works with people who need help and refugees and have been a United Methodist mission for over 100 years. And my friend goes down and she reads and she teaches people to read and she's teaching them the basics of reading. And I asked her why. Why did you choose that? And she then began to tell me the ripple effect that happened in her life when someone taught her father to read and how that changed his life and then changed her life. The ripple effect. We don't just see it in a wave in the ocean. And we never always see the origin of the impact that we experience. Just as my friend experienced that impact with her father and then her life, she wanted to create that ripple effect for someone else. You see, this is something that goes all the way back to human history. In the scripture, we read how God created humanity in God's image and that a generous God breathed life into people so that we could be a part of God's story. All impact can be traced back to that moment when we have been asked by God to share the gospel of Jesus and the generosity that being a Christian brings. The Christian story is a story of impact. The Christian story is one of life intersecting with another life that takes us all the way back to the beginning of humanity, all the way back into the moment we are living right now. Our story of Acts gives us an example of that. They devoted themselves to the teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. They sold their properties and possessions to give anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together and they had glad and generous hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And at the end of the day, God continued to add to their numbers. This passage is a passage of ripple effect taking place. Now, in the Gospels, we are given the story of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And remember, Jesus promised his followers that he could defeat death and he would reconcile us all back to God. And while the followers of Jesus didn't really understand what that meant, they were witnesses to his death on the cross. And they were witnesses to the resurrection. And in Acts 1, when Jesus ascends to heaven, he points out and gives them a mandate. Go and be witnesses for him to the entire world. Tell his story. In essence, Jesus is challenging the followers to have an impact in their world because of the impact that he had in their life. So by the time we get to Acts 2, where the scripture story is from this morning, they're already beginning to act that out. Even in the face of persecution, they're giving their possessions to someone who needs it. They're worshiping together, and they are continuing to grow. We need to understand this is not a standalone event. We are seeing the impact of the work of Jesus in their life. It is the ripple event. And that last part of chapter 2, where it talks about the Lord adding to them daily... We can sit back and go, wow. I mean, we read those 3,000 people. We wonder what that means for us in our world today. Their world was growing by leaps and bounds. But we also have to understand the context and realize that they were just responding to the impact that they had experienced. One of the early things the church was known for was its incredible generosity. Do you think if you had had a front row seat of seeing Jesus, learning from Jesus, seeing Jesus die on the cross and have an experience of the resurrection as a front row seat as one of his followers, wouldn't you begin to do exactly what the first church did? Express the love of God and let it ripple wherever it went. And that ripple did not stop. In the early church, it started and it continues all the way through to the church today. 
Some days we're better at it than others. The ripple effect is very powerful, and we are asked as Jesus' followers to do our part. In order for the impact of generosity to continue to bless the world, we have to also continue to be generous. Or as the Apostle Paul says, we have to grow in this grace of giving. Here's an important piece of all of these sermons. Generosity inspires generosity. Over the last few months, we have had that exact experience in this church. It started in a conversation about what do we do with all the leftover stuff from a rummage sale. It started with a conversation about what about this pitch hitter's closet where we give people things when they need it. It started with a conversation is couldn't we broaden that? Couldn't we help serve our community? We didn't need to keep this stuff. So a few people decide to clean and paint and create a new space. Things were sorted and organized, and what was created was a household essential bank, and it opened in January. Every time I'm here at the church when the essential bank is open, I always walk downstairs to see who's there. And what I love about that experience is that each time I find someone new volunteering, someone new stepping out in the present to provide a ripple effect for those in our community, someone new testing out generosity of time. You see, a generous life can be very contagious. When we commit to being generous, the ripple effect just continues and continues and creates more generosity in our world. And if we as a church commit to increasing our generosity, our impact will grow. If we fail to do so, the ripple will stop. We'll have very little impact in our community and we'll be known as the building that sits on the corner. How do we, as fellow followers of Jesus, impact the world around us with our generosity? Now, there's probably a thousand different answers to that, everything from serving to sharing to learning to meeting with someone with prayer. But one of the things I want to talk about is something that the church rarely does, particularly United Methodist churches. We don't tell stories of generosity. It goes without saying that we cannot share stories of generosity if we don't create them. But most people think that if I share something that I've done, that I'm being very prideful, and that's a bad thing. I often see well-meaning Christians refuse to share a story of generosity because they're afraid they're being prideful instead of sharing the joy that happened from that moment of generosity. Sharing stories of generosity We teach others about generosity. Granted, we have to be really clear that we're not patting ourselves on the back because we did something generous, but what we're doing is what Jesus asked us to do was to let your light shine before others so that you can give glory to God. What Jesus said, let your light shine so you can give glory to God. If our end goal is simply to pat ourselves on the back, then that's not generosity. You have to check your motives. But if your end goal is to glorify God and to share the blessings of God and help people know that they are loved by God, then those are stories we need to share. If we see persons being generous, then we can see how big and loving and then they can see how big and loving and gracious our God is. Each week, I have had a short video at the end of the sermon and then shared a little bit about it. And they were all stories about people learning to be generous. One about awareness, one about action last week, and this week, a story about a family learning how to be generous. So let's watch this video. So my husband is reading the Sunday paper and he comes across an article that talks about this refugee family that had gotten their bikes stolen. Their bikes were their transportation. 
And he says, you need to read this. The kids got up and it was craziness and Brad talked about what a refugee family was and, and then he asked the question, well, what can we do about this? My nine-year-old pipes in and says, I think we need to go get them bikes. And Brad said, you're right, that's what we should do. We should go get them bikes. And I thought, oh my gosh. I'm thinking we're gonna show up with bikes and they probably have at least five or six bikes by now. And my kids are gonna be so disappointed and we're going to spend our Sunday dealing with this rather than having our family day like we were going to have. We get in the car, we're all excited. We head to the store to pick out the bikes. The boys wanted to find a certain color and we knew that they had one son and so the boys wanted to pick out the bike for the boy. We pile the bikes in the car and we're really excited. As we drive down the road, we realize we really don't know where we're going. My husband called the church that was affiliated with this family. They couldn't give out the address. And he is persistent and said, it looks as though this is in this part of town, is that right? And the voice on the other end said, you're right, it's in that part of town. I kept thinking, I'm sure somebody has already made sure that this family has bikes. And so there is a line of these duplex homes and we had to figure out which home was theirs. The picture in the paper had a hose reel on the front and sure enough one of the kids said, there it is, there's the hose reel. And there's no one home. So we decide to wait and a half an hour goes by, two hours, three hours, and by that time, I'm ready to leave. We've waited long enough. My husband said, let's make one more pass through the neighborhood and then we can go home. Then the excitement starts. They're home. The little boy was telling his dad, these bikes are for us. And the only thing that the dad could say was, I like bike, I like bike. And he had the biggest smile on his face and he's like, I like bike. I said to the boy, have you gotten a bike yet? And he said, no ma'am. That was kind of a turning point for me. I think so often the need is so close that you miss it. Experiencing that joy when we drove away and how my kids were saying, that was so cool, that was so cool. Did you see their faces? That was what was so meaningful to me. I don't know how many times I have watched that video this week, and each time it makes me smile. I think about those children learning a lesson in generosity. I think about the rippling effect that continues. And one of the things I want to mention about this ripple effect is something that's known as committing yourself to a generous life. You leave a legacy. The dictionary defines legacy as handing something down from the past to the next generation. Generosity is not just about what it does for you. It's not even just about what it does for the person that receives your generous gift. The generous life has the power to go far beyond your life and your story. We know our time here on earth is limited, but the ripple effect of our generosity has the ability to be used by God far beyond our lifetimes. So a question I ask myself often and I would ask you is, 
what is the, what is the legacy I want to leave? It's not necessarily a legacy of money or that kind of thing or fame, but the opportunity to create a legacy of generosity. We can live a generous life today. And I promise you that as you do that, impact will happen to the people around you. And that impact will continue. When we think about the life of a church, we are often worshiping in a building that someone else provided for us. Because of that impact and that generosity, we continue today. So I want to end our sermon series on the generous life by sharing the prayer that I have been sharing at the end of each one of these sermons. So let us pray. I want to experience the joy that comes from being generous. And I ask that today an opportunity to be generous will come my way, and I will recognize it when it does, and that I will have the courage to jump in and be generous. Amen. Will you join with me now in a time of prayer? Lord, we come here today in the spirit of fellowship with one another. Even though we are not sitting side by side or singing together or praying together, we are still together as your people. And we offer to you our worship and our praise. We ask that you speak to us that word that we need to hear. And that as we leave this time of worship, we may be shaped a little bit more like Jesus. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the times this week where we smiled and laughed, for the times of friendship that was enjoyed and the meals that were shared, for the times when we appreciated the beauty of the earth, or when we felt peace in our hearts. And we pause to be grateful for the life that you have given to us. For all of this and so much war, we know that we are blessed and in gratitude and joy. We pray to you, Lord, hear our prayer. In our days of difficulty and struggle for the times when we have been less than our best, we give thanks that you do not turn away from us and that we are never, ever alone. And so we pause in a moment of silence to personally confess our sins to you. So, Lord, hear our prayer. And we lift to you our church. We want to be used by you, gracious God, to make a difference in the lives of others. For the need of hope and acceptance and love and compassion is great in our community. And you are the answer to those needs. Help us to show others how great your love and forgiveness is through the ministries and the actions that come from this faith community. And most of all, help us to live lives of an example of you, gracious God. And we lift to you this morning our country and its leaders and those all the way around the world. And we pray that power and egos will be put aside and that wisdom and vision and cooperation will prevail. And Lord, we pray for those who are sick and suffering, for those who are addicted, whether it is in body or in spirit, for those who are in prison, whether it is in body or spirit, 
who just need your presence. We ask that you touch them with your healing and your guidance and with your peace. And gracious God, we have shared among our community those on our prayer list. And now I lift before you in this time, we lift our prayers to you. And as your sons and daughters, hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And hear these words of benediction. As God has graciously loved you before you were born, as God graciously loves you in each stage and place in your day and your life, may that gracious God be with you, and may you share that gracious God to, with someone else. Amen. Amen.